Legends and Losers is sponsored by NetSuite. Go to netsuite.com slash legends and learn how to turbocharge your growth right now. Today, Karen Hibma Cronin. She's one of Fast Company Magazine's 100 Most Creative People in Business. We have a powerful conversation about the heart of design and strategic identity, how uncertainty creates creativity, and how Karen Hibma became a pioneer in design thinking, naming, branding, and strategic identity. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. This is Christopher Lockhead, and I am so glad that you are with us for this episode of Legends and Losers. Um, our guest today, Karen Hibma Cronin, is one of my favorite people. And she is endearing, she is intelligent, she's charming, um, she's incredibly smart, and she's uh, one of the people, there's a, a few people in the world who really taught me uh, the keys to um, design, branding, yeah, a strategic identity, you know, the core elements of, of course, naming her and her husband, Michael, are famous for being naming legends. And um, we have an incredibly powerful conversation. I'll give you the rundown on Karen in a quick second. Um, our founding sponsor is NetSuite. And um, there's a reason that we didn't um, uh, take on as a, a sponsor, a left-handed underwater basket weaving company. Um, and the reason we love NetSuite is because they share our mission. So if you're an entrepreneur and you are um, growing, you have a growing business, and the interesting thing about growth is we all want to turbocharge our growth, and growth comes with a whole bunch of challenges. So NetSuite, like us here at Legends and Losers, is committed to um, empowering and supporting uh, entrepreneurs in driving growth. And so uh, what you really want to think about is, do you have the platform that's required? Um, is it time to move your business to the cloud? Uh, HBR uh, says that a lot of the major stumbles for growth could be avoided if somebody saw the early warning signs. Do you have visibility into what really matters in your business? Organizations like the Girl Scouts, GoPro, uh, the running shoe company Asics, the company I love called Big Agnes, they make tents and, and um, sleeping bags and, and uh, lots of good outdoor gear. William Sonoma, the Boston Globe, one of my favorite charities, Kiva.org. All of these organizations rely on NetSuite to turbocharge their growth. It's a cloud-based management system that gives you visibility into everything that's going on in your operations. So if you were sold out of inventory in your warehouse, your website would know that, your team would know it's time to reorder. And so you get real-time visibility into what's happening in your business, invoicing, cash flow from your desktop, from your laptop, and of course, from your smartphone. NetSuite is offering Legends and Losers listeners an opportunity to have a consultation with a growth expert in your industry. Check out uh, netsuite.com slash legends. And when you go there, you can set up a time um, and uh, uh, an expert in your industry will get together with you, talk about the challenges, talk about the opportunities, and see if there's a way to blow something open in your business. Go to netsuite.com slash legends to schedule your free one-hour growth review today. netsuite.com slash legends. Now, my friend, Karen Hibma Cronin. This, she's a wonderful woman. And um, we have, I think, an incredibly powerful conversation, and I'm so glad to share it with you. Um, in the design, naming, and identity world, she's a legend. Uh, she's a co-founder with her husband of her firm, Cronin. Uh, her husband, Michael, was also a legend, and uh, we were terribly sorry to lose him when we did. Um, Cronin is a strategic identity design consultancy firm. They work with uh, breakthrough people here in Silicon Valley and beyond on what it takes to um, design a legendary brand, a legendary name, and ultimately an enduring identity. Um, she has been involved with uh, Amazon Kindle, with Apple, with Estee Lauder, with Origins, with Levi Strauss, SF MoMA, TiVo, and believe it or not, Karen has worked with the White House. She is an American Institute of Graphic Arts Fellow and National Board Member. And now here she is, the incredible Karen Hibma Cronin on Legends and Losers. Okay. So um, what, what are you up to right now? 
Ah, boy. So um, I finished two, three really wonderful projects this last year that involved, um, you know, this thing that I'm inventing my own little category of uh, strategic identity, because I just think the word brand is so beat up, you know, it's kind of a tattoo that, you know, gets applied to things. I understand brands because, you know, if you're the the uh, Western rancher who has this cattle ranch, you know, you are that brand and your cattle are going to walk around with it on their hips. But I think too many people invest in brand energy where they really don't know who they are and who they want to be. So strategic identity is in that process. And occasionally, as you know, we've done some pretty memorable names when people have got something that they wanted to launch in the world. And um, there, everybody does naming now. And a lot of names are actually um, kind of pastiche names. They, are, they don't really matter. And Mike Maples and I had a very interesting conversation this summer about how important naming is. And he does really still think it's important, but you know, companies can get by with a simple name rather than necessarily having the be all end all name. So I'd rather work with businesses, making sure that their business is where they want to be. So sometimes with startups, like, you know, on Lisa's business that, you know, you, we've talked about, um, you know, she's in this amazing phase where she's got a great name catch and release and she's got a great arc that she's gone through she's got her you know first rounds of funding and stuff like that but she's now building you know what could be a phenomenal business and the That's startups so cool. that i get to yeah you know, and you are such a great supporter of hers what did she say that you've got her on she's got on speed dial so <laughs> yeah she likes she likes that so and of course you know my new granddaughter was just delivered talking about pregnant pregnant mom ceos um you know, i've got a grand brand new uh grandbaby when was um, she born uh, October 28th. Wow. So she's Congratulations, a a Karen. That's yeah, so fun. I know. I, I bet know. you hate being a grandmother. <laughs> well, I've got a almost seven year old granddaughter already. Who's the big sister. So, you know, I've got a little experience in this, but yeah, no, it's, 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 um, it's a very interesting thing, you know, going back to Judy Chicago and the birth project. Um, I said, we, we, you know, I like we're talking with you because we make big circles. Um, Judy came to my oldest son, Nick's birth, and did the drawings that became the birth project from Nick's being born. Uh, she'd done the dinner party and then she did the birth project. And this goes back to, you know, hearing your heart from the inside. Um, Nick is always a little, you know, not quite sure that that's because mom doesn't have one of those, you know, but um, that's where he came from. And, um, the amazing thing about it, of course, you know, they're feminist artists, my feminist husband, I had feminist doctors, and out came this little boy, you know, so. <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so. Right, it's like a guy like me, I'm surrounded by women. Everything well, is female in my house. Well, Everything. And you're also magnetic for all of them. And, you know, you are, you, you are good at, at being that person that, fits into all their lives and you know but you know when we got these two cats right did oh, i tell you about cats? these cats no no where are they have they so they're up? yeah they're outdoor cats oh okay. so so i'm allergic right which is a giant fucking bummer because oh. everybody has animals so right. like if you have animals i can't right. come over for dinner it really uh. it sucks anyway so we can't have dogs and cats right and and carrie loves cats right point a Point B, she, oh, so, you know, we have a garden and we have our dinosaurs and all that. Right. And when you have a garden and you have dinosaurs, you have problems cats solve. Uh, yes. And point three or dot three that gets connected is she figures out that the Humane Society, at least here, has a program called uh, Working Cats, where they bring in feral outdoor cats and they get them all snipped and clipped and, and, yeah. and they chip them yeah. and they, they clip their ears so people yeah. can immediately tell that they've been you know, fixed and chipped and right. somebody loves them and cares for them. And so, uh, and, and then they adopt them out to farmers or to, you know, 
manufacturing plants that have rats and shit or warehouses or you wow. know whatever. Wow. And so we adopted these two cats. And so I said to Carrie, I said, okay, baby, can we at least get one of the cats has got to be a boy cat because, of course, all the hens are <laughs> hens, right? And guess what? Thelma and Louise. Girls, oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. And, and they're that, is great, that their too. Name? Yeah, Thelma and oh, Louise. Oh, oh, God, I can't wait to meet them. <laughs> oh, they're great. They're just, they're so great. And now yeah. um, they won't let us hold them, although I can't because of my allergies. But uh, Carrie can now pet Louise. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. cats are interesting creatures. I, I forgot when you were here, we had cats, but probably they were out of the room when you were around. Anyway. Yeah, and I seem to remember there was a, was it an indoor outdoor thing that was going on, or was yeah. it, what time yeah. of year was it? I don't I don't remember getting sneezy at your place. <laughs> no, no, no. We we spend a lot of time indoors and outdoors, so that was that was that was wonderful. So yeah. Uh, so um and how busy are you working on on i uh, what did you call it identity what did you strategic, strategic identity yeah. strategic so, identity. identity yeah yeah and, so, and is naming i assume is under well, that umbrella very often what people think of is they think they might need a new name and so the first thing that i'll do besides you know the get to know them conversations and find out whether it's somebody that I feel could be transformed or is transformative um, is to be able to uh, do a, a, an assessment of where they are. And that's a very interesting process for everybody because it's the deep therapy, you know, you know, and talk about where you're really learning about. Um, you know, a company and the people that are involved in their clients. And, you know, you're talking about, you know, uh, General Crystal and, you know, for Ayashti, we were talking to the DARPA people, you know, it was wonderful. And, you know, we get permission, like I did back in the day with creativity, I get permission to have phone calls with some of the most amazing people in the world, because they're involved in whatever this company that I'm working with is. Now, the difference is that my conversations are always in deep confidence with everybody. Um, so then I assimilate all the information that I learn from those people. Um, and um, Hannah, who you've met, who works with me, you know, will transcribe the notes. So then we have these So you meet with data. everybody individually, right, Karen? I do. I mean, I, I and, try to, you know, um, I mean, it, if there's a hundred people in the company, it's about my maximum, you know, for, for, you would, it, you would, you would sit down and talk to a hundred people in a company to come up with their, to come up with their strategic identity. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, wow. I mean, the, the, you know, I mean, wow. I'll schedule, I usually schedule 15, 20 minute phone calls. I tell people that so that they don't feel boxed in. And then I, but I tell them I've reserved the whole hour for you. And it's amazing how often people once they get over that first part of the conversation, you know, like, you know, they want to talk and they tell me the true things that are going on in their lives or in the company. And I usually have a set of 10 questions that I'm asking everyone so that I and can. What are you listening group. for? With, you know, what are you listening? What's mm. what, you know, cause I know oh, when I'm doing go. category design, I'm listening yeah. for certain things, right? What are you listening for? So that's why we're trying to write this book, Elegant Questions, Design Answers, because when you do that, listen deeply, you're listening for the thing that is the core thing, the question that's not being asked. And you know that from yes. category design. Um, and, but you have to ask the really simple questions, the journalistic questions, the you know who, why, how, what, when. And you ask those and you get the story. And then you piece together parts of the story so i mean but our, there's a there's a set of dots right that you're connecting i know you are mm -hmm. and so what are those things what are those triggers what are those what what are those things that when people say you go okay that's important well so again you know, it's defining the problem that you want to solve, and then you turn it into a project. So if somebody's issue is, do we need a new name for our company, then that's the thing that I'm deeply listening for. How is their existing name 
being heard or seen in the world. Because a lot of companies have really bad names. They do. They do. Here's my current favorite. You ready for this okay. one? Okay. Oh, yeah. So this is a European bank. I think it's, uh, I think maybe Holland. Right. Headquartered. And so in Europe, I think the name's probably fine, but they're marketing themselves now to uh, an American marketplace. Right. And the name of the bank is, I swear to God, I'm not making this up, Rabobank. <laughs> the fucking bank's name is Rabobank. <laughs> That's what the fucking bank's name is, Karen. So funny. Well, I, 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 the ad comes on TV. And I'm like, hey, hey, you're spending millions of dollars and they're building a brand called they're, Rob a Bank. They're, they're marketing to United States consumers with that name? Yeah, the company's called Robo Bank. Yeah, and, and they, don't, they don't mean like Robo Bank. They're not. They don't mean like, Robo Bank. Yeah. And they sure as hell can't so mean funny. come on in here with a gun. This yeah, is a country yeah. where we have more. Guns oh than people, God. you dumbasses, oh and and I'm so I, I listen to this and I I just think like did nobody tell them like nobody told them it was it's sort of like your mother didn't love you right yeah. because she dressed yeah. you that way yeah they, they spell it R A B O B A N K R A B O B A N K and it's the on, uh, on. Bank. So, uh, so they say i think in uh, europe they say rob or bank. something yeah. like that yeah. right which probably yeah. works just fine in europe yeah but Except here no, it's no, a no, bank no. called the, fucking uh, rob yeah. no the alliteration is crazy no it's 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 amazing and yeah. like nobody told them like hey uh, you know you got to sit their ceo down and say hey well, jimmy uh, let me tell you what the giant <laughs> elephant in the room is nobody will tell you it, it's a totally an emperor's new clothes thing it has to be. So, so what I feel bad about is the group that actually helped them either create that name or gave them that name because they didn't do their job well. Don't, don't you feel that people, you know, in communications design, part of our job is being that filter for people. And, you know, I mean, somebody has got to tell them the truth. It's like, Hey, uh, you know, you're fat and your mustache is weird. Well, like somebody's got to tell them that can be adorable too. That can be a cartoon. You well, know, I guess that with a mustache. So nothing wrong. With I, I'm, I'm probably mustache. remember the, right. um, remember the conversation with um, Kim Scott, radical candor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I probably need to work on what did she call it? Like obnoxious aggression or she had a great phrase for, you know, Boy, she's you, got it nailed. She's, you know, she's really understands that rapid pace delivery of that, you know, kind of context. And it, it is interesting. I mean, you ask about the range of what I'm working on. In a way, the projects that I take on are so deep that I go deep with each of them, you know, for a period of time. And so I'm not handling volume. You know, I don't yeah. want volume. I want deep relationships and I want transformative things that are going to change the world. So when you guys went to name the Kindle, can, can you take me inside that? No. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? You know, I mean, no, not going to yeah. do that. Need yeah. an honor. <laughs> no, no, no. It, well, it is, it is um, one of the most wonderful processes. And at some point or another, I'll ask to be released from all those non disclosures. But um, the real wonderful thing about anybody's name is that it's personal to them and the issues that they were thinking about and the opportunities they saw are personal to them and it makes it complicated to be able to um, put out, you know, the story in the world of how you solve that particular problem. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it, what a great name. And, you know, I think Thank of you it. guys every time I hear it and see it and I just think, what a great fucking name. Well, I think I told it, you it, I was, I was driving mm, mm, a little over the speed limit in my Prius driving up to atta, Willits. My atta sister lives You're still allowed there. to say a girl, right? Uh, I can yeah, still say uh, no, girl. I, you, you can, you can <laughs> say it, but you know, um, uh, the, uh, and you know, you were talking about, you know, watching Star Trek on your Kindle, I think. And I, you know, I was like, and, and I'm listening to you as I'm driving, which of course does accelerate your speed. You know? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> 
but yeah, no. That I, woman in the pre-eye is driving <laughs> like a Mario Andretti. <laughs> well, I drive a 2002 original, you know, the, the, the one that they used to park up front at all the Silicon Valley parties because it was, you know, like the highest tech thing that was going around. And then it went through a period of years where they were kind of tucking it more in the back because, you know, the, the Teslas were getting the front space, but it makes it back up to the front now. So, you know, it's, it's kind it's of the It's probably model, spinning back model. around right yeah yeah it's the model t of that technology and you know it's it's so interesting i i think my next car hasn't been designed yet i think about that a lot you know that that you know what is that next car um you know and maybe it isn't a next car you know maybe you know i love lyft you know it's so wonderful that i can punch a button and these amazing conversations happen in a lift you know, isn't I, that that whole category? Isn't that a mind blower? It's phenomenal. It 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 it's transformative. And your friend with a car is great positioning for that company. That's one of the reasons that I think that they will have a more duration because the people who are driving are humanized, and the people that are reaching out for those rides are human beings and expecting a human being to pick them up. You know where you know, brand X is much more of a efficient, you know, this is a business transaction model. Well, and the other thing that's fascinating, of course, to me about Lyft through the category design lens is um, it is very rare to have a category king, never mind a category king at, at, at the scale of Uber. Right. Um, commit the, if you will, company Harry Carey that that company has, has been committed. So, so this is an interesting thing. Um, I look at their board and one of the things that I'm interested in doing, I'm, I'm serving on two nonprofit boards now and I'm interested in evolving to serve on more corporate boards because I think, didn't their board see this coming? I mean, Ariana Huffington was on the board. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a Look, lot here, of, here, you know, uh, I don't know all yeah. the board members, but yeah. um, I know the benchmark guys, you know, right. not, we're not drinking buddies or anything, but I've known them for years and years. And, too and, bad. Yeah. yeah, too bad. They're really, they're really smart, but yeah. a, a lot of respect. And we've, you know, crossed paths on, on a number of things over time. And right. um, uh, I don't, I don't know if the respect's mutual, but I think they're amazing. Anyway, unprecedented in my knowledge and i asked a lot of people and i've right. lived in the silicon valley for 21 years 22 years right. unprecedented that a top tier venture firm would sue a founder of a company they invested in like yeah. never never happened yeah and so i think the benchmark guys and this is purely my interpretation based on zero conversation so just i want to be super clear but uh, my guess is a they were they were fighting for what they thought was right and for their investors right. as well. I mean, no, no right. question. Right. And, and B, I got to believe part of it, uh, Karen, was to send a message that like, hey, we got, you know, we got fucked over by this guy too, right? And, and, and if you do this, we're going to come after you. Like, I think if I, let, let me say it this way, were I in their shoes, part of, of suing him would also be the public statement that that makes. I don't know how much that was in their mind or not. Again, this right. is based on zero conversation, right. but um, an unprecedented move. And, and I think one that says, Hey, we, we didn't, we didn't know how bad this guy, you know, was. So um, there's so many things. Cause I love these hard wicked cats you know i mean i love tom cats <laughs> there's something really compelling about you know bad boys who are inventing new universes um i didn't get to actually meet with steve jobs but we did the identity for the lisa computer if you can think of how far back that goes wow that's um, so cool and um you know michael and steve didn't necessarily see eye to eye in terms of how Steve acted with people, because Mike was a gentleman and Steve wasn't. But Mike, Michael was a, uh, I hate to interrupt you, but yeah. he was, um, I almost said teddy bear, but that's not actually no, 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 how no. I mean it. There was, uh, yeah. But, but there was, there's something very uh, welcoming, endearing. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. very easy to be around. Like you want to be around him, his, his presence in it, 
he's a, he was a person that his presence in the room was immediately noted and, right. and the room changed for the better, even right. if you didn't know who he was, right. you know, so there was this, I don't know. Speaking of room uh, change, I'm going to move because my bottom is wearing out on this one. So let's okay. try another. <laughs> Jesus, it's um, complicated. Too heavy. I don't know. I, yeah. I remember him as a very big, very warm presence in a room. Let me say it that way. Yeah, and, and you knew him, you know, in his um, later life, you know, not necessarily in the early years that, you know, like with a lot of us, you know, I we met when we were in our early 20s. So... Um, How's the light there? Is that okay? Yeah, that looks great. And then it looks okay. like, are those some Karen glasses I see behind you? Is that? Uh, no, those are Leah's, paint? Leah Garchek's glasses. Those oh, are, that's her cool. collection of, before she had her eye surgery, that's a whole group of, of her glasses that, that um, we painted. So, um, uh, yeah, so difficult Tomcats. Um, I just feel, and this is where I enjoy this, you know, when, when, I get brought in to these conversations um, there because I love men and I love women. I love, you know, I, I just like people and I especially difficult people are sometimes the most accomplished. You know that. Um, but you have to be willing to hear them out and find out what they're going for. I, I don't have a whole lot of experience with evil people but I try to avoid evil people. And I don't necessarily think that there, there was evil going on in there. I think there was a certain amount of force majeure that was happening. And I do feel that that is one of the things that boards can do is that, you know, they, they have to be looking out for the business interests, but they also have to be understanding the people that are involved and the people that are making this business go and grow. So, you know, when I get brought in in that wonderful role as a consultant to be able to speak truth to power, you know, which is what we, our job is to do, um, I feel like that should be what boards are doing because they're independent, autonomous people with their own backgrounds and experience. And it is complicated, particularly on a board, because you're dealing, you know, you're with other people. But I'm I'm really fascinated by the opportunity, and I think that that's probably. So you want to go future. on some boards? I do. I yeah. do. I think you know. <laughs> just, you know, maybe I'll I'll be like the you know the the surf, and you know I'll try it, and I'll think you know I don't want to do that. But but then again, I think I probably. I would be curious five years in w what you think about being a board member and what what your experience was and is. Yeah, I'll be very curious to see. Well, the interesting thing in the nonprofit ones, um, so we've served a lot of nonprofit and worked with, of course, a lot of corporate boards. So I know them from the consultant side. Um, and what I didn't do with one and did do with the other is actually interviewed everyone on the board before I went on the board because I wanted to make sure that they were people that I could actually team build and that and that they understood the purpose of the organization and essentially that they really wanted me to come in and, you know, be a voice and make a contribution for it. So that has been different. The, the one that I didn't do that with was one that I thought I knew, which is always a, you know, that makes an ass out of you and me, you know, the assumption. Um, but I would say that in, if in five years I am on, boards i i would be or maybe a board or two it doesn't have to be i again like i'm not interested in volume i'm interested in people who want to grow and make a difference and besides the two nonprofits, i'm advisor to god four or five other organizations but an advisor is kind of like board member light you know you get called when there's a problem to solve but you're not there trying to figure out the whole strategy of anything so um, but I think the kinds of understanding that, you know, we have from the work that we do is about what is the driver. So individuals, you know, executives are figuring out their strategic identity. Um, companies are figuring out their strategic identity. Our, you know, country should be thinking about its strategic identity. I had the chance to talk to a group of all the, um, communications and um, 
exhibit people for NASA last spring, which is about a hundred people. And um, the, I, they wanted me to talk about storytelling and creativity, which is like, oh, I think I know a little bit about those two things. So I had a great conversation with them. But at the end, one of the women asked, you know, well, what, if, what would you do if NASA wanted you to come in and work with them? And I thought, wow, you know, what an opportunity that would be to be able to do. But, you know, that's complicated. I mean, that's, they're dealing with, you know, the government bureaucracies. I've watched Hidden Figures probably three times now. And isn't it amazing to realize that these women computers, you know, made it possible for us to get out into space. I think it was, I think Heather Clancy told me about that, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think I remember yeah. that. Uh, yeah, very, very cool. And a story nobody, well, nobody, I sure, I sure didn't know. Well, there's a lot of stories like that. And, yeah. and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things like the word computer. We didn't remember that that, you know, initially meant a person who could put figures together. And now we've, now we think of it as these machines we use. So, um, and lots of layers of thinking and thought, but I, I do know that sometime or another around the 16th century that there were a lot of big ideas came into our world, including, you know, first publishing of books, um, you know, the, the, a whole lot of the understanding. That didn't change anything, did it? <laughs> no, it, it, you know, and, and the fact that you know, besides the hand lettered books that the monks were doing, which were rare and, you know, in a monastery somewhere or another or in a cathedral, um, the fact that books were designed to fit in a saddlebag, you know, on a horse, because that was the transportation, you know, so the size that we think of now is because that fit in a, in a saddlebag. So I think I didn't know that. that. Ideas. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. year old ideas, uh, almost 500 now, you know, as we're getting into the 21st century. But you know, we think about like your, um, and I've forgotten his name, the gentleman who was on who was talking about, you know, China, that, that what's going on in China right now is just in the current moment. You know, as Brian Eno says, you know, we, we live in the long now. You know, there's a lot of time on either side of where we are. You know, there's the time behind us and there's the time ahead of us. Hopefully, you know, if our species doesn't get eradicated by our own stupidity, you know, the, the earth will probably survive and regenerate. We're going to uh, just disappear into the matrix. Well, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we go beyond our corporal bodies. You know? Well, no, it, it, it's a weird... Corporal bodies have no, a lot of fun. We're going to get, <laughs> we could get really weird here, uh, but... You know, if you start to think about, uh, okay, so how far away are we from your smartphone or whatever that, that category is going to oh, morph yeah. into is oh, yeah. a thing that's embedded in your body. How right. far is that? Right. right. That might not be that right. far. Right. right? Um, uh, I just shot an episode of Legends and Losers with Duncan Davidson from Bullpen Capital. And to say the guy is smart is like you know, saying Steph Curry can play basketball. Um, and he had some fascinating things to say. He's focused on Bitcoin and blockchain. But he had, the big thing that he had to say is he thinks the next 15 years are going to be a, a, a time of mega innovation. And he compared, compared I, it to I, other points in I, time. I, yeah. where, you know, you go from a farm economy to all right. of a sudden there's electric light. Right? So, so, so trace back... 1916 Pan Pacific Exhibition, San Francisco, 10 years before that, had burned in the fire. And the city rose up like a phoenix and built that whole Pan Pacific Exhibition. And the It Boys, um, Henry Ford was out here. He'd made a factory and he was rolling the first Model T's off an assembly line as an exhibit at the Pan Pacific Exhibition. And he's sitting there in a really great photo that I love with Thomas Edison, who was just, light bulb was just kind of starting in, and Luther Burbank, who is not quite as, you know, renowned in the world, but he was transformative in plant culture. So they were essentially the, you know, the Elon Musk, the Steve Jobs, right. the, you know, whatever of their Bill day. Bill Gates, whoever you and, want to talk you know, about. Yeah. You come forward into 2016, you know, he's exactly right that we are at this nexus point of AI, of VR, all these amazing things coming together. And 
I mean, he I says think, in 15 years, it'll be asinine to think that you'd ever have driven your own car. Well, but uh, driving a car is pretty cool, Christopher. Well, that's what I think. I have a Shelby I, Cobra Mustang. Yeah, and I, I think know. driving that I, car is pretty I, fucking cool. <laughs> I, I know. We've, we've had one of everything over the years, you know, and I think about the, the Prius, you know, I remember fondly the Jaguar and the, you know, BMW and the Mercedes and, you know, like all the, <laughs> I've not had a Tesla yet. You know, that would have been, that would have been an interesting step. And, you know, maybe that's the car that hasn't been designed for me yet, but I love to drive. I mean, I love being out on the road and making the thing go. But I also think you're right that the matrix may turn out that we are, we're only using a tiny portion of our brains, you know, um, one of the and people- some of us, not even that. <laughs> oh, so Christopher, you know, my son, Christopher has dyslexia. And I, re- we, I remember that we did not find that out until he was in, I, I'm bad. I can't remember. It was third or fifth grade back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and we were lucky because you didn't find out until you were, you were 21, 21. Yeah. So he was, you know, in that awkward preteen stage or early teen stage, but the Orton Gillingham society had this workshop that parents went to, to understand what this was. And we were sitting there at these tables with these bad mimeographs that were almost impossible to read. And people were walking around behind this saying like, you know, you've already seen that, you know that, you should get that done, you should go faster, you know, that's a little, you know, that are just like, and your psychology is stressed because you don't understand this. And I'm thinking of you, you know, and, and all these people who are the most brilliant people, but they were people who didn't under, you know, it didn't work, the formula for them. And, you know, when, on the road and this goes with you know people who are maybe driving slow in the fast lane you see all these glasses this is because i've had a couple of eye operations for glaucoma and you know my vision is going and i don't like that but i'm i drive a little slower now when i'm especially driving around berserk do you think it's going going uh the i had one surgery that fixed one thing i have another surgery coming up that's going to fix another thing and i think it'll probably be less than it was but um, they're preserving what they had. But I spent a portion of this last summer with about 85% capacity in my visual, you know, I was blowing everything up to 48 point type so I could read it. You know, it's really freaking annoying when you get another email. <laughs> well, you know, because you have to like blow it up really big so you can hope to see it. But what I discovered through that limitation you know, and this is legends and losers, you know, every time something goes away, you figure another strength that you didn't know you had. The good Lord opens a different door, doesn't he? Yeah, classic, (laughs) classic. But, but just finding that, you know, the brain still worked. And actually, it was kind of interesting. I mean, if I was going to meetings, I had to go with a, you know, a seeing eye friend, you know, to to do things. Um, But in the meeting, I can forget about it, you know. And so, I mean, they had told me seven to 10 days of recovery after the surgery. So first of July, I was booked up for the entire summer with some pretty major commitments. And I got them all done, you know, delivered people happy, you know, all that stuff. But now I'm, I'm going into this uncertainty, but it's really interesting. You know, you've spent time in Cronin Design's process or Cronin's process of, of, of work. And we learned this wonderful thing about inoculating clients, about that uncertainty. And my son, actually, my younger son, Sean, turned that back on me because a period of uncertainty is probably the most creative time that you have. And if you can accept, and this goes back to creativity, if you can accept that what's going to come out of embracing that uncertainty is going to be, you know, probably a much more creative thing than if you're basically a hammer looking for a nail and hitting anything that looks kind of nail like in the process. And it's a thing that, if we tell clients that in the beginning that you're going to feel this little like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in an idea. And and you tell them that ahead of time when they get there, they're excited. And then when the good idea comes up, they see it. 
Whereas the opposite. So can, can I stop yeah. you? Sure. No, I love this story and I can tell it a lot of ways. Well, I just, I don't want to lose this yeah. thing that you said around, because it's, it's exploding in my head. <laughs> this thing around uncertainty. Right. Fueling and driving creativity. Yes. Yeah. I had so, never thought about it like that, but like, of course, the greatest love songs are written because our heart is broken, right? Yes. The artist's heart is broken. Yeah. And, and I think about, as you were talking, I'm thinking about music and, and a lot of the great albums and, and, and songs that right. I love, right? Right. And it is interesting, and this is probably unfair to a lot of artists, but it is interesting that there are a lot of artists who their best work is done early. And, and it's not that they don't do great things later, but like, there's a body of work, two or three records or whatever, you know, two or three novel, whatever it is um, that, that it sort of stands alone. And I wonder if part of it is after those two or three records or, or, or um, books or whatever it is, the artist is now successful and not struggling and less the uncertainty about whether they're going to be able to continue or make a living as a, creative person or whatever that then diminishes right and i wonder so it just made me wonder is there any correlation i guess same same thing for companies i mean you know that happens in businesses too i mean you specifically talk about the that constant evolution or the you know the businesses that get to a certain point and then they're just harvesting you know these artists that you're talking about some of them get stuck in their harvesting mode where they found a niche that's successful i mean the beatles are infamous because they were continually reinventing themselves and people were heartbroken when you know the cute boys that they'd fallen in love with became these you know indian gurus you know um it, it's 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 a complicated process but this i would say from you know having lived a life now and i could go back in each decade kind of know what i thought my life was at that time even though my dad passed away at almost 94 so i had a bit of a roadmap ahead to look at someone who was living a life well for all that time but um the uncertainty is, you know, partly chaos theory, but if you are able to embrace that chaos and know that if you are comfortable in that uncertainty, that you give more opportunities for, you know, whether, you know, I, I like to say the universe to give you great new surprising startling answers and it's the people who are pressing through thinking we got to nail this we got to get this done you know they've got their marching orders they're marching they're not you know dancing they're not inventing you know they're not they're not coming up with something new it feels more well maybe it's just because of the way my head's wired but it feels more of like a fight <laughs> like a struggle yeah well and and uh, you know, you know a lot about fights and, and, you know, you know how somebody can win a fight by being unexpected and resourceful in a time that they're doing. But I don't know. I mean, I just think of individual lives and they're spread out over decades. Companies are, you know, now, you know, collapsed into, you know, a decade can be transformative in, you know, quite a few of the businesses we could name from our area right now where, things as they were, you know, staying in a hotel have become, you know, staying in somebody's home, you know, which is yeah. fabulous. Which, mind blowing, right? Yeah. No, I mean, come on. Who yeah. saw that coming? Well, was, I don't even, you know, th those no. guys didn't even see that coming. No, no, they didn't. Right? They couldn't, they couldn't have known that that was going to be remotely well, close to what it is. What I love is that they were actually design students and they had actually spent time in that creative process of, you know the design problem solving and i think that's so wonderful in fact that's why design thinking has become such a phenomenon because um the design thinking process is one where you allow that uncertainty but you know that you're in a process to get to a result that you know is going to be executable um so I, can I, I i gotta ask you this yeah how does it feel? You talk about stages of life and all the things you just talked about. Right. How does it feel being Karen today? Just uh, knowing what a, a huge contribution that you've made, obviously you and Michael made, and 
uh, that you are a leader in design thinking, you're a leader in teaching um, breakthrough ways about doing design, thinking about design, the connection between design, name, brand, category, uh, the, the whole creativity part, uh, the, the, the art part, and, and particularly in a world where there's a lot of people in the corporate, if you will, branding, marketing, identity, category world who are frustrated artists. And so they're just doing art for the sake of art, art, whereas you understand the distinction between the painting behind you and, and the, if you will, corporate artistic capability to come up with Kindle, right? So you're a practical artist or creative in that context, if you understand what I'm saying. And so I guess what I'm trying to say to you is there's nobody in the world that wouldn't say that you are, you know, one of the grand dames of, of the modern era of design thinking and um, branding and naming and all of it. And so I guess what I'm asking you is how does that feel? Well, thank you, Chris. It's, it's like now, and now I feel a little bit like I should be a book put up on a shelf. But no, no, I don't mean it that way no, at no, all. I, but I, I mean I, that's I, the I, place I, you're at, yeah. right? You're the master sensei. Well, you're the monk. You're the you're the you right. No, yes and no. Um, uh, it it's fascinating how much. Um, and you know this because you, I think, retired, you know, I mean, when, if you're actually in the stream, and this is where, you know, going back to my, you know, putting myself a little bit more in the world, I've been living in this, you know, paradise for 13 years, and I, I love it, but I'm a little bit outside of the, I mean, in, I'm, you know, in a, in a remote place, I'm, I'm really excited and, you know, Michael died five years ago now, and that's just, you no know. No way. Yeah, I know. I mean, I've tried really hard, but I can't bring him back, you know. And so it's. God, I wish I could help you do that. Well, after 40 years of a partnership, it's a big deal to figure out how to just be me. And my kids are grown. You know, they're accomplished people on their own, um, you know. And there's so many things that are really interesting. So, so the, I, I mean. Look, I don't well, how you I kick feel. me under the table, but yeah. I mean, how, 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 I mean, you're, look, because I see you more in a business context, right? right. In a right. creative context. Right. Um, and from what I can tell, y you seem like you're doing great. But yeah. holy shit, 40 years. <laughs> and, and. I think it's 45 now, but uh, that's yeah, okay. That. 40, right. 45 alone, you know. But, uh, and in a business context, yeah. Look, there's no question that he, he was a genius. There's just no question. Right. And so you have to reinvent yourself in Yet your again. business, right? You're yeah. missing your partner, your business yeah. partner in genius. Yeah. And then you're missing your incredible husband. Well, so I did reinvent myself so many times before. So I had the research business for seven years and then I had Nick. And at that time it was hard for, you know, a pregnant person or a nursing mother to be in business. And Michael asked me to come in and help him. What year was Nick born? 1980. So and you felt in 1980, not so much in the corporate world. Oh my God. It was, I mean, you know, in that, in that A-frame tent that I was wearing, you know, it was, it was definitely, <laughs> you know, like your friend that stood up in the meeting and showed you her bump twice, you know, that was, that was something that, you know, nobody wanted to see back in those days, you know, that was, that was complicated, but it was also interesting because I had done well enough with my research business that I retired. I was, <laughs> I thought, it, I thought I was going to write a screenplay and have a new baby. Can you believe that? I mean, that was, first of all, writing is very, very difficult, as you know. Um, but um, so somewhere or another in that process, Michael had started getting work through a lot of my colleagues through San Francisco Women in Advertising with Levi's and San Francisco Symphony. And he was typing the invoices kind of diagonal, you know, and they were, I think they were framing them rather than paying them. So he was <laughs> struggling, you know, to get the business going. And so he- Really? Had, you mean the creative geni genius was not so much on the accounting? Uh, shocking. Well, he had a person who was, you know, a professional was working for him, but she had an attitude, you know, and uh, it, it was complicated. So 
So then he wanted to grow a business. So we grew the first version of Cronin Design up to about 45 people when early days of technology. And that's not, you know, ginormous, but it was a good sized business. Yeah, a serious boutique, right? Yeah. It, so, legit. And, and, you know, we had our big offices in the city and doing all that. And then Michael had developed this line of clothing and tried with two other people to launch a business with it and it hadn't taken. So I thought, you know, I could do that. So I did created Cronin Artifact, which is our product development manufacturing company. And then we did the walking man line of clothing and won a few, you know, awards and a few nice customers and other stuff like that. I still have loyal customers. I still have inventory, which is amazing. But after about almost 20 years of that business, um, I was taking care of a lot of family things. Um, my, you know, kids were in high school, family was having health issues. The younger brother was schizophrenia who um, was struggling, actually living on the streets of Palo Alto, homeless, which is very interesting when you're walking between business meetings and you're going like, hi, Steve, how are you? You know? Wow. Yeah, but but uh, you know what's really nice is each of these circles has closed gracefully and elegantly. Um, the last year that Michael was alive in 2012. Oh, so backing that up, we ended up with technology and a couple of other changes in life, narrowing down Cronin Design to just Cronin, which I created to you know work between the two businesses and um, focusing specifically on the naming and identity. And that was a huge leap for us to do because at that time, just in 97, 98, that was a fairly new thing to, to do for a design firm. And as you know, we had a little success with some small names um, that evolved out of that. Um, a little success? You guys have been named every list of the people who are the most legendary at this shit. You, you, I mean, come on, give well, me a break. <laughs> I get the modesty. I get it. I get but, it. But, but like, I'm not confused that you've been named this most innovative, creative by all these people. And I mean, oh, I know. The, I, the awards you know are the awards the, are mental. What I loved about the Fast Company thing was so wonderful. That was their very first list of the hundred most creative people in business. I love that it was about creative. They weren't talking about, you know, design, business, whatever. They're talking about creative. You know, well, and here it, you're talking about the woman who, you know, rewrote the, the script. <laughs> so I, that's. And didn't that's they, am I, I like remembering this wrong, Karen? Didn't they name sort of you and Michael as one person on no, the list? No, I'm 88 and he's 89. Oh, okay. So yeah, they did no, they, separate they put you us two together. Yeah, no, and actually, I think Brian Eno was. 90 and um I'm how ridiculous is that name. you're you beat okay. brian eno on the list well the, <laughs> you know i never really brought myself to ask them how they you know made the did, whether it was did a you know him do you know him well through the long now um um you know stuart brand and all those guys are you a long now member Christian? i don't even know what that is okay so do you know who stuart brand is i don't oh stuart brand created the whole earth catalog among a other startling oh, things yes, and yes. and basically Stuart brand has been at the tipping point of every evolution in ahas and uh learning creative process everywhere and he's walking around he's here in san francisco they have a group that brian eno named belong now they have a does brian um, eno live here now no he's in london he's okay. he's in london um but you know, just about everybody in the, you know, so Jeff Bezos is a member and a huge contributor to the Long Now Foundation, some of their research they're doing. They're doing this amazing thing called the Clock of the Long Now that is um, being developed in, in uh, Texas that is this phenomenal timekeeping instrument that's in 10,000 year increments. Um, they have probably almost weekly lectures and monthly big talks at um, San Francisco Jazz in the city. 
and brilliant scientists, thinkers, whatever. I, I'll, I'll you're in all it. these groups of these super ding dong people. I love it. You're just, you, I see, I'm not in this world, right? Well, you've been in the business world and, and you talk about companies that I don't know that much about because I've never actually had the privilege of being inside some of these, you know, real hard creative. I mean, our biggest thing was we were working with Silicon Graphics from back in the day, which is where we first met Mike Maples, you know, when he was a junior marketing person there. Um, to their whole, you know, everybody, everybody starts, and, everybody oh. starts off as a white belt, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's very nice. And then, don't you have to go back again in the cycle of the learning that martial art? I, that would, uh, I well, like if you're learn. if you're smart, you're always training new right. disciplines, Begin, right? Beginner's, so, beginner's mind, yeah. Right, and so, and look, what do I know about anything? But what I know for me is um, for my life to be working, I have to be learning stuff and I have to be doing stuff that I'm not good at, you know? So like now I'm doing Pilates, oh, right? Yeah. Like there are no guys doing you, this. You have, to be, you have to be doing stuff you're not good at. And what was the first one? And, and, um, uh, uh, you know, learning stuff. I, I'm, learning, a, learning. I'm a curious yeah. person. Yeah, yeah. Right? that's 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 the answer to your question. And I find I I'm get a, more curious, curious over person. time. Yeah, curiouser like I, and curiouser, as they said. <laughs> yeah, like I, yeah. Uh, like even when somebody says something completely offensive or stupid or whatever, I find myself uh, more t uh, tilting to, you know, tell me why you think that. Like, uh, uh, help me understand that, right? Um, anyway, well, it's, it's what makes it interesting. And I think, um, part of the gift of this, um, strategic identity work is that I'm interested in these people. So if you're an employee in a company, I want to know how you see the company, what you see the future of the company being, why you joined up with them who you are, what you see your future being, where you think you're going. And, you know, I'll ask people these questions and I'm not judging them or I'm not in any way going to convey that information to their superiors, but I'm really listening. I'm really curious because that's where the strength of an organization comes from. You know, if the, the person who's leading the company has a vision. Oh, so I want to ask you about this. I've been saying this for a while. I think to me that strategy is 10% vision and 90% tactics. You know, if you don't know where you're going, then I, I don't like these things where everything is strategies, the strategy for that, a strategy for that. You need kind of a core destination of where you think you're going to land. And then if you, everything else becomes tactical. So I started using, there's a Google Doc that's a wedding planner. I started using that as a matrix to show companies how they needed to think about getting through a transformation in their business. Because brides are like, you know, it starts out, um, you can look this up on the Google Doc thing. It starts out where it says basically, you found the right person. So, you know, obviously if you're planning a wedding, You've got somebody you want to marry. I mean, there's not a many groom. People. Yeah. Right. Is or that is that requirement one? Or a bride, you know. I mean. Well, yeah. Or, I mean, depending. Or two if... grooms, you know. I mean, we live in you know the modern world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's a Wait, partner. Wedding, there's wedding, another wedding, person wedding. involved yeah. in the. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Even though I did see something recently, there's a woman who's engaged to a chandelier. Jesus, Facebook gives you like weird memes for your mind. Um, but <laughs> you know. Go ahead. I don't. Uh, oh, no, it says, I don't give a shit. Go marry your <laughs> chandelier. I hope you live happily ever after. Right? Yeah, it 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 made you know an interesting like what you know in the in and I actually kind of like they, that. You know? They probably live in Santa Cruz or or Berkeley. Uh, I think you know this is uh, it's English, so you know it it it's. Um, but yes, I mean, what is the slogan for Santa Cruz about the weird? I just yeah, thing? keep Santa Cruz weird. Weird, yeah. As Absolutely. if, as if it was a concern that it was going to stop being weird. Well, but 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 this goes back to chaos. You know, a lot of companies are terrified of weird. 
they never go weird. You know, I mean, it was also just a, named uh, the second happiest place in America. Cool. Santa Cruz. Cool. You've got Huji or whatever the Danish call it. You've got that, you know, good lifestyle. But, you know, also you said earlier, collectively in Santa Cruz, people all kind of know things in common that are about the environment. Now, yes, you yes. know, that's very helpful because being that next to the ocean, which is a huge undiscovered part of our little planet, um, you know, you are getting all that osmosis of the water, you know, the molecules changing, turning. The air is different atmosphere. here. It is, yeah. yeah. No, noticeably. Yeah. 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 So now, I got to ask you, how yes. do you think about um, strategic identity and category? You know, I've been kind of, I mean, as I absorb, so I want to show you something. I was waving this at you earlier, but I have this funny thing that I do when I read books. So can you see the, the colored wow. pickies in there? So Wow, um, that's crazy. Like, I, I do that yeah. too, but like that's, you? you're at a whole other level. That's yeah. like multiple times what I do. I mean, that looks like a book full of post-it notes. It is. So, so do the blue, colors mean particular things? Yeah. Or? So, so blue is like, a don't go there or a wicked problem or whatever. And I could read you that section, but I have to switch glasses. And that's like, that's a section that you're saying, you know, if you do this, this is not going to happen. And so if I'm trying to figure out something, I can go through, you know, my books and I can look at these blue marks. Orange is always about creativity. So that's, you know, pretty fascinating. It was towards the end where you guys were summarizing you know, I'm like orange, 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 orange. Pink is usually about people. So for example, when I'm interviewing a bunch of people, you know, the tabs on my notebook will all be pink because I know those are human beings that are sharing their story with me. And when I think of them as human beings sharing the story, it fits better into the whole aspect of the business. Purple tickets are a little hard to find these days. But those are like those, you know, royal ideas. Those are like the aha visions. And yellow is usually like a bright idea. Green is a good, it's about making money, you know, or like how to see profit. So I can, through my sticky, wow, sit, sit that's down incredible. and reread your book if I'm going into a conversation with someone in probably an hour um, because I've, I've, I've highlighted and color coded the, ideas it's completely different than writing in the book or highlighting in the book because then you have to like find all Go those find things. it yeah and remember yeah. what chapter and actually, so how many books do you think you've done that with karen oh god normally i would have my stack here but um yeah. uh oh hundreds hundreds of books um, yeah wow I mean, that's awesome well if you what think a great idea back in the beginning you're so that, smart <laughs> resourceful uh in the, so when we were doing the creativity project, there were no stickies, Christopher. We had to put index cards up I on bullet the bars without stickies. with thumbtacks. You know, that's even worse than there being no internet. You know, it's <laughs> it's 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 so funny. I mean, if you wanted an idea, you had to go to the library and look in some kind of card, you know, holder to find where you thought the ideas might be. And the best thing, this goes to creativity, and we're talking way well past your time now, um, but when we would go to the, the, the library, on the shelf next to the book that you thought you were looking for were four or five other books that were like waiting for you to find them, but you wouldn't have found them except you were looking for that one book. So right. that's part of this chaos is that if you're, able to meet with and talk with people and um, embrace that you you're you're more than likely to end up with um, something that is extraordinary or you know unique or individual it's so cool so um, I guess yeah anything I, I'm not sure how far we got down the path but anything more on your mind about category and identity so i just i love you know how 
category has been there, but you all brought it out to really being an initiative that people could understand and, you know, identify and, and use. And I think, uh, what did you just say recently that um, for chief marketing officers, that that's become part of their, you know, qualification, which- Jennifer Johnson said when she was hiring for her last job, it was the number one thing that um, we were looking for. So, so marketing managers uh, and, you know, bless their hearts, but some of them are hammers looking for nails because they're trying to solve a problem that they've already defined the problem many times so narrowly that they're missing the obvious around them. But, you know, they will drive a company right down the railroad tracks of where they're going to go, where there's like an immense universe around them. And I think for me with category design, and you are explaining the difficulty of doing your own category design. I mean, I love that. Hard. It's hard, you know. It's hard me, on yourself. I can see yeah. it for you in a nanosecond, but for me, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's crazy. It, and, you know? and that is the gift of solving other people's problems. So yeah. I, had, I had a workshop here, and I'm going to try to answer your question. I had a workshop here for San Francisco Design Week this last couple of years, and um, it was an elegant questions design answers workshop. And the first one, I was a little more tentative. The second one, I was braver, and I put myself on the table along with everybody else. So a couple of things is that I asked people before they came to the meeting to give me an email and tell me what their wicked hard problem was that they were trying to solve. And of course, maybe about a third of them did that. But, you know, I've learned psychology of people. You go into the meeting and I say, oh, thank you so much, all of you. I really appreciated your sharing, you know, your problem with me. And so each of them who hadn't done it is sitting there thinking, shit, I better get this together. You know, because <laughs> everybody else did this. I, I guess I should too. So as they went around the room, and a lot of times problems just need reframing so that you can think about them differently. And but I try not to, you know, get people into a box, you know, too fast just owning the problem and being able to articulate it in trust to a group of people who are strangers. I mean, it's so different when you're meeting with a company and everybody's got one problem to solve, but meeting with a group of people, what I found by the time we were getting around the table and actually got to me and I told him my problem was writing this book that I'm struggling to take my skill in working with one-on-one with an executive or with a company and to turn it into this universal thing that, you know, can thump like you've done with, you know, category design and put it out there. And you know the struggle, exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but they were starting to solve each other's problems because other people's problems are easier to solve than your own. But by sharing that, and I, and I told them, look, you know, this is what design is. Design is this wonderful, you know, awesome possibility of taking a thing, breaking it down, you know, into its parts, understanding the parts, and then remembering that there's art. And art is bringing those things back together in some new way that you haven't thought of. And, you know, I mean, I end up at the end of those sessions, as we do with our, you know, intensives that we do with clients, where at the end of the day, you know, you're like saying, go home, go home. Because <laughs> people have just, Nobody wants to leave. They're all fired up. Nobody wants to leave. They are all fired up. And, you know, the idea is to keep them having that sense of being empowered um, through the whole process of doing. So I think category design goes back to my strategic thing. I think category design names that 10% that's the vision. And if you can think about that, then everything else becomes like the wedding planner. It becomes tactics. So, you know, what's the band going to be? What kind of music are they going to play? Where are you going to, you know, what kind of, who are you going to invite? What's the location going to be? Who are, you know, what's your seating arrangements? You know, what are your flowers going to be? Where are you going before, during, after? You know, it gets really... What shoes are the bri- is the bride going to wear? Yeah, and, and the, what tux is the groom going to wear, you know, or not? And, you know, my Nick and Annalisa got married 
um, barefoot in her grandmother's garden. And, you know, I mean, these were and now as, as somebody who's performed multiple marriage ceremonies, oh, that's right. you have that power, the, you know, power divinity. Yes. Uh, in, instilled or instewed or imbued or in, <laughs> embedded in me by the church of the Latter-day Dude. Yeah. Uh, there's always the seminal question, what's the dudist priest going to wear? <laughs> oh, yeah. And oh, I remember you have a special pair of shoes that you used to wear for for um, marketing events, right? Yeah, back in the Mercury Your days and shoes. even before that. Yeah, for big speeches, I would wear a pair of uh, very red Prada shoes. And, uh, you know, I retired them when, when I left Mercury, but maybe I should bring them back out. Well, for there's something about or something. Mercury and shoes that matches together, you know. No, and it was so it's, big. It's it was, it was, it was yeah. such a big icon in the company yeah. Yeah. that when this sort of big closing party happened, that you know, there's right. a big outdoor meeting and shit. And, right. um, and Tom Hogan, who was the head of HP Software at the time, Right. He came up on stage wearing red shoes, you know, as a way to say, wow. you know, we're one no, of you. We're, we're, yeah. we're coming to you now. Yeah. Right. He was yeah. it was a symbol for him to wear red shoes on stage because everybody at Mercury would immediately know what that meant. Well, and this goes to, you know, coaching executives. Um, there are a lot of times where, you know, I mean, if you're wearing silk boxers, you feel different about yourself, you know, because you can shift on stage a little bit. And, you know. Wait, wait, wait. Did you just say if you're wearing silk boxers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I have a. I love that you know that about men, that like if you. I had a men's clothing company for almost oh, duh, of 20 course. years. I mean, of Jesus, course you know. I, I know a lot of guys, whether they dress left or right, maybe, you know it's like you know yeah, no it's and, funny and, and there's been really specific because you know that I'll, I'll be at a dinner party and women don't know how much their men have thought about what they're wearing and they if they thought about that little teeny check print that they like better than that other little teeny check print you know yeah and there's been this renaissance there's this uh rebirth now in the men's underwear category yeah right and there's yeah. all these companies now that have and the new shit is amazing and i won't go into details about why right. but to your point right. when you have the right underpants on you're the man <laughs> no and and same thing for girls you know thongs are us you know i mean it, it's amazing you know there's a lot of things that i that... don't know how we got you ladies to wear those things because <laughs> they're freaking comfortable you well, know? see, I, I had no idea about that. And so when I moved to the United States, the only time I'd ever seen them on a woman, this is going to make me sound terrible, but was it a strip club, right? Oh, well, and, and this is where we have to go back to that conversation that it, isn't it amazing that spectacularly beautiful women are showing their beauty in that kind of environment, because that's what our society allows them to do. You know, I mean, that's, that's, hard we we limit the beauty that is there to being kind of seedy and over here in a category i mean it should be i don't know why we're such part of our lives. about stuff right well because we're puritans you know we we've grown up with you know and and it's hard to control that i mean you know there there are cultures where like the hawaiian beautiful beautiful hula is so amazing and you look at those all sizes of bodies and they're you know moving their bodies in ways that you know we don't even i mean we don't we walk you know and, and we don't even walk with a wiggle many of us because no yeah we don't our, move, I, our world you know i mean when you were surfing you had to learn to move your body um to yeah and your to feet and your hips board. and yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and you become, you get out of your head and you actually are kind of having your body knowledge being able to inform you and you're, you feel powerful and connected because you're doing that. And I mean, just think of what we've kept from our world because, you know, I mean, you know, kissing could lead to dancing, you know, it's like, yeah, exactly. So, um, but any, anyway, long story longer, I, I had no idea when I moved to California that, that, that ladies were actually wearing these things in the world. <laughs> and 
that was a happy day when I discovered that. Let me put it to you that way. Well, and, <laughs> and you know, I, I haven't met um, Carrie, um, but I know that you have amazing women in your life. And, um, you know, it, it, it is so interesting because this is where, you know, if you had daughters and now I have granddaughters, you know. Hey, I have six daughters. They're just, they just have feathers. Oh, and then I have two more with fur. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, they are living their, you know, their, their best lives in your world. You but know? I do have a lot of nieces. Uh, right. My sister has three and uh, Carrie's sister. Uh, so, so you want them to grow up in a world where they are strong, empowered and beautiful, you know? Oh, and, absolutely. And, and, the and they is, are. And, and so as a man, your job is appreciating them and understanding that, but wanting them not to be where society is denigrating them for that I, I don't know i mean will we be able to bring forward a world in which we're able to appreciate that and you know the gay and lesbian culture you know is an amazing other world of people exploring expression life identity um it's it's very complicated and i think there's so much opportunity if we can kind of back out of some of the boxes that we put ourselves in as to why we think certain ways about certain things. Well, and for me, I've thought a lot about this and, you know, we've talked about this on legends and losers and right. um, the Coco Brown episode was a really big one for me, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, and I just met a woman who knows her well, and I'm going to explore the Athenian group. I think they're fascinating. I want to learn more about what they're doing. Yeah. yeah I mean, I got to believe you'd be a, an incredible addition um, or, or, or whatever role you might want to play. But um, I, I, got, I mean, I don't know Coco very well. You, you, you ex experienced the, the, uh, Episode, you know, the yeah. depth of our yeah. relationship on yeah. Legends yeah. and Losers, yeah. but I got to believe um, she would love to, to meet you and have a dialogue. Um, but so I've, i you know, I've been thinking about all of this stuff as it's been going on and I, in my mind, part of it, yes, there's this repression part where like in our world, we can't talk about this stuff and uh, yeah, we're repressed the pure, the puritanical thing, which, you know, and then there's people in Europe who are laughing at some of this going, this is ridiculous, right? I, you know that. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, there, I, I've looked around the world and other than maybe, older cultures, you know, there, there just isn't a contemporary culture where it's all balanced. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling. And I hope that, you know, the definition is correct, that possibly we've gone through a breakthrough moment in a, in a country that should be being leaders. I mean, I hate to see well-meaning liberals taking the fall as well as, you know, uh, people who are, less well-intended, more concerned about, you know, our moral values, but they're not exhibiting them themselves. There's a lot of repression in society that, that it works to be a patriarchy, you know, and I don't want a matriarchy. I just want everybody to be their own best selves and, and to, you know, be curious and to enjoy themselves and to live this present moment that we're given to fully experience, you know, experience beingness. It's a little uh, I couldn't agree about. more. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah, sister. Um, you know, the other one I've been thinking about as it relates to boys and men, and I don't hear this in the narrative, is can we have a real conversation here, guys, about two things, sex and violence? Can we get real about this? right? Because human beings have natural drive to both. Yeah. And as a man, as a boy in our culture, I think we need to learn how to take that natural drive for both of those things, which, you know, who knows, there's edge cases and people are different and blah, blah. But I think a lot of men experience, certainly I do. And we have to learn how to channel that drive how to take responsibility for that drive how to well, how to deal your... with the expression of that drive in a responsible adult way 
Well, some of your guests, you know, the SEALs talking about warriors, you know, I mean, there is a, there is a part of our culture where people within their fiefdoms are working to become warriors within their culture. I mean, you've, you've interviewed such an amazing range of people, Christopher, you know, people who, you know, the, the, the guy who'd been in jail, you know, that you're Navy SEAL, you know, the, 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 um, God, we've the actually had two SEALs for, on, but who's yeah, counting? No, 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 no. And you've had, you've had repeats. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and we have SEAL friends. So I know the, I know the psychology and it is a, you know, it is a, a warrior psychology. I mean, you know, I, you said Carrie's a kickboxer, you know, I, I think that, that I don't think necessarily as a woman that I need to become physically assertive in that way. But, but there is something about thinking about, you know, uh, Maya Angelou said, you know, be a warrior, not a whiner, you know? <laughs> and, well, you know, and here's the thing on that part, which is a, this, when I realized this, Karen, it was a very big eye opener for me. If, if you're not trained at some level in self-defense, right. then the sa your safety and security and the safety and security of the people that you love is 100% a function of other people's behavior. Yeah. And when I realized that, that was shocking and not cool for me personally. Well, uh, and I was not, once I realized that, I was like, okay, wait a minute, that, that, that doesn't work for me. So, but, but I'll modulate that a little bit to the, for example, you know, I've survived as many years as I have by having a bit of an awareness of not putting myself ideally into the kind of context. So I'm being very brave, putting myself in a world where I am going to have a lot more interactions with random human beings. But I look at that as a, you know, a traveler, you know, it's, it, it's hopefully going to be an interesting journey, but I'm aware of, you know, and I, I'm, I do, I mean, I am physically fit, but I'm not like, you know, a martial arts person, but I, I think, you know, it's good to learn that it's good to know that, but you know, part of it is just understanding the psychology of what's appropriate to do in the world and not appropriate to do. Yeah. And the thing about that, so, you know, there's a whole bunch we could unpack here, but some people think that if you train in self-defense, that this, there's this new age bullshit that what we put into the world is what we get back. Right. I wouldn't call it bullshit. Well, I mean, it's it's just trying to explore an idea that people have kind of, you know. No, no, I understand that. But yeah. what I what I mean by it is, like, some people take it to the extreme, and they think if they sit in their parents' basement drinking pot till they're forty, that you know, but they think drinking, drinking pot, wow, drinking pot, yeah, exactly, <laughs> uh, until they're forty, that you know, they'll attract billions of dollars to their startup or whatever, right? I so no, that's no, what I mean no. that there's this yeah. extreme no. stupidity towards it that, that, that sort of shows up. Um, but what, what I would say, and so, so I hear this thing about like, well, if I get trained in this stuff, then I'll attract this violence. And the truth yeah. is, it's what happens is actually no. the opposite. You, have, you have an, you have an aura, you have an aura of capability. And that's, that's, I think, you know, that is, I mean, we, there's, a, as you said, a lot, there's a lot to unpack in all of this. Unfortunately, I actually promised the electrician I was going to meet him at the new well, house. Well, and, 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 and no. um, um, yeah, this has been an amazing conversation and it's been a, a, uh, this has been a classic Karen uh, 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 Legends and Losers, right? Classic, <laughs> twisty, turny, and uh, yeah. So well, I'll, I'll let I, you go. Yeah, I, I feel like, um, you know, I've so, and I thank you again, I've so enjoyed the opportunity to go along for the ride with you in this experience. And, you know, I look forward to the evolving episodes of all of this. And, you know, we've got to figure out a way that we can maybe make snippets of this so that, you know, that can be shared a little bit more. We've actually started to do that. Oh, have you? Oh, good. Yeah. Um, Great. Are you on our, are you in our Facebook group? I am, but um, uh, I'm I'll actually you on your, I'm on your, I'm on your email probably twice because I probably signed up a couple of times. Anyway, I get a lot of legends and losers. Okay, stuff, so that's good. So anyway, we're starting to do, um, we're starting to do snippets and uh, we right. just really have started to do some marketing. And so we're marketing episodes like they were an episode of a, you know, uh, a cop thriller or something, right. Where they you right. get a sense of what the story of the episode is. So we're, right. we're experimenting. Yeah, it's fun. 
Right, right. Well, I, I just thank you again so much for the conversation, Christopher. And as you know, we could talk for hours and hours and hours and hours. So Well, we just um, did for a couple, but uh, <laughs> Karen, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you're an incredible, incredible human being. Um, your work speaks for itself. Um, <clears throat> who you are in the world speaks for itself. And I can't thank you enough. You're a treasure in my life. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you very much, Christopher. Really appreciate the call. Be legendary, my friend, as I know right. you will. <laughs> Thanks, my dear. All right. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye -bye. All right. Bye-bye. Wow. Um, I just feel so lucky to know her. And I also feel incredibly lucky that the people that taught me the most about branding, about design, about identity, about naming are Karen and her husband, are uh, Peggy Burke from 1185 Design, and are uh, John Bielenberg. And all three of those legends have been on Legends and Losers. And uh, I'm proud to call them friends. And, um, uh, you know, just amazing insights from an amazing woman. So if you know somebody who would appreciate Karen as much as I do, why not share it with them? Uh, or why not share her with them right now? And uh, we'd love you just a little bit extra if you shared Karen on social media right now. Now, um, uh, Heather Clancy and I are working on this book called Niche Down, How to Become Legendary by Being Different. And um, the number one question I got after Play Bigger came out was, how does the concepts of category design apply to me in my career or me in my small business? And um, that drumbeat just got louder and louder and louder. And as I did more podcasts and did more speaking and so forth, um, that was the question. And so uh, Heather and I thought, why not write a book to answer that question? And so Niche Down is all about how uh, you can become legendary by being different. And if you want a free teaser copy to Niche Down that comes out later this year, 2018, then <clears throat> write in a, um, a review of Legends and Losers on iTunes or wherever you enjoy podcasts. Take a screenshot of that review and email it to blackhole, all one word, blackhole at legendsandlosers.com. And we will email you a free preview, a teaser of our new book, Niche Down. And uh, check out legendsandlosers.com and subscribe there. Uh, we've got an awesome new newsletter. We're taking our uh, newsletter game up, so to speak. And so if you subscribe on legendsandlosers.com, you'll never miss any of the fun. All right. We would like to thank. Cronin, Strategic Identity Consulting at Cronin, C-R-O-N-A-N dot com. Our good friends at Verve Coffee, the official coffee of legends and losers. I'm actually enjoying a cup right now um, in beautiful, beautiful Santa Cruz, California, Los Angeles, California, San Francisco, California, available inside most of the major tech companies in Silicon Valley, in Tokyo, and always at vervecoffee.com. HarperCollins Instant Classic Play Bigger, How Pirate Streamers and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Why not pick up a couple hundred copies wherever you buy legendary books today? Equity Directory, connecting startup talent to the resources they need to build a legendary business. Check out equitydirectory.com. The nonprofit One Life Fully Live, Dream, Plan, and Live Your Best Life. Check us out at onelifefullylive.org. A podcast we love, the Business Leadership Series with Derek Champagne. Uh, he's a wonderful guy. It's a great podcast. Check out Business Leadership Series podcast. Now, if you love Tahoe like I love Tahoe, and you've been thinking about maybe buying a vacation home there or changing your life up and moving to Tahoe, regardless, check out TahoeTruckyHomes.com. My good friend and adopted brother, Matt Hansen, will take good care of you, TahoeTruckyHomes.com. And of course, Doctors Without Borders, Med Saint Sans Frontier, making a difference in the toughest places in the world. You make a contribution, we make that difference. Check us out at DoctorsWithoutBorders.org. All right, we must remind you that this podcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared the shit out of it right now. All rights do remain disturbed. We must warn you that the producers of this podcast may have been consuming libations. All episodes, of course, do contain nuts. Teach design. Listen to Leonard Cohen. Remember, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Never jog by a prison. Call your dad. Do not pour lore legends and losers on your crotch. Remember, this podcast is flammable. Don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Uh, thank you so much, Dandy Candy. I love you, mom and dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go to Marcus Rust. 
the CEO of Rose Acre Farms, the company behind the salmonella eggs. Sorry, Marcus, we just ran out of time for you. That's it. We look forward to seeing you again on another episode of Legends and Losers.